Hi, welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown. Today I'm going to give you a brief overview of the topic of scientific racism. Um, there's, of course, a lot of details to this story that are um, there in the readings uh, for class, um, but I just want to give you a kind of overview of the significance of this topic um, and uh, some, of the, some of the major aspects of it. So um, the, th the thing about scientific racism is that the history of our modern ideas of race, and race is, a, is itself a fairly modern idea, is intertwined with the history of scientific racism, right? So race as a kind of political concept, race as a scientific concept, and um, the, the use of science in a racist sense are all tied together. The emergence of each of the human sciences, okay, anthropology, psychology, etc., is tied up with the emergence of modern ideas about race. The two are um, are connected in each in, in in each case. We start with um, natural historians and natural philosophers as early as the 16th century, um, and the modern concept of race we see is developed to explain the superficially obvious differences between human geographical populations, as well as to justify the racist atrocities that Europeans began to instigate throughout the world, starting in the 15th century. Um, now, at the time, some argued that racial differences were merely superficial or environmentally caused, but many others insisted that racial differences included deep differences in capacities, mental abilities, um, uh, especially, um, and that the differences were biologically determined, right? Um, so uh, that, was a, that was a very common view. In the 19th century, concepts and theories of race were further developed by physical anthropologists, evolutionary biologists, and others. Um, Pre-Darwinian scientists like Samuel Morton and uh, Louis Agassiz made extensive physiological and anthropological comparisons of members of different races in order to argue that the races were different, um, hierarchically ordered species, right? So um, this is known as polygyny. Um, that's the idea that the, the races actually uh, are species with separate origins. Now, um, Many Darwinians and social Darwinists, like Herbert Spencer, for example, used the theory of natural selection itself as a mechanism to justify the racist ideology of biological determinism. So Darwinian or, or pre-Darwinian um, scientific racism was a continuing line. Now Darwin himself, um, who certainly didn't fully escape the racism of his time, does seem to have largely been opposed to a biologically determinist view of racial differences, although it's a complicated historical question. And in the early 20th century, um, with the emergence of the new scientific psychology, there came attempts to measure the differences in mental abilities, uh, or we might say cognitive capacities, between races um, that had been posited by earlier thinkers and defended by Samuel Morton, among others, on, on physiological grounds. So a variety of psychophysical, behavioral, and cognitive tests were developed in the early days of psychology. That was a big, a big um, part of early psychology. Um, and the most infamous, of course, today is the, uh, is the uh, intelligence quotient, or IQ, um, and the IQ tests. Um, and we'll talk a lot in class about, um, uh, and maybe in, in Discord, about the IQ test. Um, but when IQ tests became common in the early 20th century, they were soon, you know, added to the repertoire of ways that scientific racism attempted to establish the innate hierarchy of races. There's lots of um, irony here, uh, including the fact that um, the originator of the IQ test, Alfred Binet, um, seems not to have believed that IQ uh, was a, a heritable trait or even um, a single, that it measured a single property, which we might call general intelligence. But the, nevertheless, the essentialist biological determinist readings of IQ um, grew in popularity, right, as the test became widespread. 
um, particularly in America. Now, by and large, this history of thinking on race reinforced status quo racism and white supremacy by making it seem natural or inevitable, right? So that's the main sort of function of scientific racism. Now, some, some, some racists did defend racist and paternalist policies on a cultural or environmental view of racial differences. So it's not that there's an essential link between biological determinism and scientific racism. Um, but historically, biological determinism has been more commonly linked to such policies. And it does seem to make racial hierarchy more inevitable, right? The, the ideas uh, seem, they're not essentially linked, but that there's, there's something there, right? T today, um, and, and a lot of the reading focuses on this, it's relatively easy to see the fallacy, fallacies and um, the biases behind such research. And there's, there's been several prominent analyses. Um, uh, you know, uh, Gould's probably is the most famous, so we'll talk both about the essay version and the presentation will be by a group talking about the book, um, The Mismeasure of Man. Um, but there, there have other, been others, of course. Um, but I think it's key to note that this, this research in its time was well regarded and considered to be of high quality, right? Um, I think it's also uh, important to note that this uh, trend in research is not over. Um, this kind of research continues to be done um, that we, I would group under the heading of scientific racism. It reappears regularly in the press. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in it, socially speaking. Um, despite the fact that it always turns out to be of poor quality, right? So the, the research never holds up to scrutiny, but by the time the fallacies and problems have been pointed out, the attention of the press has kind of moved on, right? Now, let me just say, I mean, a few things about Gould. Um, you know, Gould provides the kind of classic example of racist values leading to low quality science. Um, he describes the case of Morton in detail, and I think we'll see, um, we'll discuss that, the details of that uh, later on. But this sort of cranial capacity physiological research, you know, was aimed at reinforcing the sort of hierarchy of races. Um, and Gould shows how, right? Morton's not exceptional, so run-of-the-mill 19th century racist values um, influenced his work and led him to literally mismeasure, right, the skulls in his collection. Um, I, I, it's worth noting there's been some scholarly debate uh, you, continuing into recent years about whether Gould's defense of Morton um, is accurate uh, or um, whether uh, Gould also had a kind of biased or problematic um, approach. You know, my own personal view is that there, um, there are some errors in Gould's analysis, but that in essence he was correct about um, Morton's biases and their effect. Um, and I, you know, I think there's even a sense in which Gould himself falls prey to some of the um, racist assumptions about, uh, you know, the kinds of questions that Morton was asking. In other words, he treats them as meaningful or or, or valid questions in some cases when they really aren't. Um, so the whole the whole project of finding such racial differences is problematic. Um, not just Morton's biased implementation of the project, but the whole project is problematic. Now, I think if you know, think about what we've learned in this class already. There's really nothing about the processes of science as they exist that prevents biases like racism from being reinforced. You know, Kuhn would say science is a relatively conservative institution uh, that you know focuses on that, that's dogmatic, right? That that um, uses the paradigm at hand and doesn't question it. And this, um, if you think about the social effect of this, especially research that bears on human uh, 
interests, you know, the human sciences, this this often reinforces the status quo, right? Not not because science itself has some kind of big C conservative political values, you know. In fact, most scientists are not conservative in that sense, but because you know the paradigm driven, or you might say peer review driven. Um, an expert evaluated nature of science makes change slow. This is the kind of thing actually that, that Feyerabend railed against, but would have to admit was, an, was a part of the scientific process. I think we could add to this, you know, a recognition that scientific careers are still somewhat difficult to access for those with less social privilege, right? So in the past, you know, scientific careers were closed to all but white men of means, right? Not even all white men. Um, today, right, uh, that certainly has gotten better, but there are still, um, uh, you know, barriers to access, barriers to entry um, for, for the, uh, those who are less, uh, less privileged, right, um, who have less social privilege. Um, and, um, you know, these things combine to make it quite difficult, I think, to get rid of the racist ideologies, um, if we can use that word, that were with science from the beginning, uh, or at least have been with these um, parts of science since their beginnings, um, these, these sciences. Um, and, you know, insofar as overcoming them is a project, it's a long-term project, right? Um, now, that said, right, uh, science doesn't need to and doesn't always problematically reinforce the status quo. Science does have some capacity to self-correct, but it's, um, it's, you don't get it for free, right? Scientists and society have to carefully foster that capacity. Um, there has to be openness to alternative perspectives uh, in uh, science. That's what Feyerabend would say. Um, there has to be consideration of social values. Um, uh, and um, something we'll see coming up um, in the future is uh, that, that those values used appropriately, say anti-racist or egalitarian values used appro appropriately, actually have helped debunk bad science and have led to better methods and results across a variety of fields in the human sciences. Um, Gould, you know, made very clear his own values right, when he was writing about this topic. Um, in the book, Mismeasure of Man, he cited his personal experience in the civil rights movement. And he argued, uh, quote, we have a much better chance of accomplishing something significant when we follow our passionate interests and work in areas of deepest personal meaning, right? So Gould was not you know, shy about the positive value, uh, positive influence of values in science. Um, uh, so, those are some of my thoughts on on scientific racism in general. Uh, kind of brief overview of the topic. Um, we'll get into a lot of the more detailed arguments uh, in class or on Discord. Um, uh, if you have questions, of course, um, you can always leave them on the on the video here. Um, otherwise, I will, uh, I will look forward to talking to you later uh, and see you next week.